Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I have the utmost pleasure of being here with an amazing woman in business and finance, Samantha LaDuke, entrepreneur and founder of LaDukeTrading.com and CIO at LaDuke Capital LLC. You are a macro to micro analyst, an educator, trader. Your clients span from retail to institutions. So happy to have you here today, Samantha. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much I, for the invite. I love that you're you know, continuing this trend of, of promoting um, women in trading and finance. It actually, it elevates us and it also helps others who are thinking about this space um, to see what they can be. So I applaud you for that. Uh, it is a it, it is a labor of love. It takes some time, and it also takes some time to to kind of grow it. So again, congratulations on that. Thank you so much. That's what we're here to do: elevate each other. So let's go fishing with Samantha. <laughs> Please, Samantha, tell us your background. How did this all begin? Well, I am very much um, an entrepreneur. There's no question about that. But this is a, an evolution, a journey. I think everyone kind of has their own. I'm not afraid to reinvent and find out what really um, drives my passion. And I was very committed mom, very dedicated, focused on kind of running a business on the side while I was bouncing babies on my knee. And I loved doing that for 10 years, um, but then I had, um, my son had a medical emergency. So it was a big deal, it rocked my world. Um, and I sold my business, my 10 year uh, young business um, from ICU at Boston Children's Hospital. So I uh, took a year and a half off. And when he went back to school, um, and I had two uh, older daughters, um, when all of them were back in school, I really wanted to uh, not take on so much risk and focus of uh, starting a new business. And so I decided, after some deliberation, that I would focus full time on markets as an independent uh, retail trader. This was September of 2008. <laughs> so <Great> timing. <laughs> I, um, I had, you know, just, but the, unfortunately, I'm not someone that does a little bit. So I kind of really, really, really dug in. So anything I could possibly learn, um, I found really great mentor. That was the very first thing I, I did because I wanted to kind of shorten the learning curve. I wasn't sure if I was so interested or enamored with the bell, the, the buy side or the sell side. Um, I didn't come from a pedigree of, of working on Wall Street. I was very much self-taught and I still am. So uh, restriction was not my jam. I just wanted to figure out really where my place was, what, what style I had, if you will. So I really tried and focused on finding the best traders, the, the best fundamental analysts. This is before Twitter was all the you know easy access, um, the, just from literally macro to micro, but I didn't know it. And I would shadow these mentors and figure out what I could take from it and basically adopt in my own style. This was very, very helpful for me anyway, um, to over time kind of figure out how to interpret the language, the market in my own language versus theirs. And I will emphasize that, you know, most of the mentors out there were men. It was very, very hard to find women in trading and finance. Um, I, in fact, Mish Snyder was one of my first female mentors, love her. Um, and so she was very opening, you know, opening up just the, the doors of what about this? What about that? And uh, introduced me to all kinds of folks. And so that was somebody who actually brought me up um, and she'd been in it for a long time. And it just was really um, exciting to finally meet women who were doing this trader education um, or, you know, managing a book of business or, you know, um, doing analysis, research and analysis. But it was a lot of work to kind of assemble a list. <laughs> um, and so over time, that list grew, my confidence grew, my ability to interpret the language uh, of the market, um, my way also caught on, uh, hence that kind of macro to micro. That was that was something I, I came up with about four or five years ago. And I remember my director of marketing said, why that? Like, can you pick something else? Nobody uses that. Nobody knows what that means. And I said, but that's exactly what I do. Macro to micro, operationalize what's happening in the macro backdrop 
into an, into a, an actionable trade. We're going to keep it. And now it's everywhere, macro to micro. So um, I'm, I stuck to my guns. And uh, basically, this is a journey still, no destination. Um, I am very much enjoying the, uh, the, the process. I love it. I love your passion. Mm. Um, you know, autodidact, you're self-taught, you learned along the way, a true entrepreneur. Because as an entrepreneur myself, being an entrepreneur, I think for 25 years, over 25 years now, um, we're always learning. So I admire that amazing story. And I love how you created your own methodology. That's key. And I always tell people that it's about internalizing the information and creating your way, not mm -hmm. following others. And I love the macro to micro approach, you know, having studied economics myself many years ago, um, I just, it's so important to look at it from the top down and from the bottom up. And then at that middle point, it's like a little sweet spot right there. So I think it makes a lot of sense and good for you following your gut. Cause obviously um, that is a buzzword these days. So that is, and then it's, and it's tough to stick with convictions um, when you're kind of into the, in a new space and trying to navigate and trying to find out. And there are a lot of folks um, that dis dismiss or um, talk over or, you know, put us down. And I was very, very, if nothing else, I was very resistant to, to all of that. <laughs> I was very resilient <laughs> Um, because my curiosity, my my grit in wanting to make an impact in this business, not just for myself, but also as a voice of women, was very, very strong. So um, I'm 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 a lot stronger because I exercise that muscle of not being afraid. And it was also kind of I know you talk about risk management, but um, risk is for me anyway, defined very simply, don't risk more than you're willing to lose. So when I put it in that kind of context, there was in this business of kind of pushing with my own methodology, with my own viewpoints, with my, you know, my own business style, whatever. Um, it was very much what, what do I have to risk by doing this? I, I didn't feel like it was a risk. I felt like it was an adventure. And I still do. And I've made some you know, great projects that have flopped. Um, I've hired some great people that haven't worked out. So, I mean, it's it's an exercise and this is a learning planet. I'm right here for it. Um, bring it. I want to I want to keep getting better and grow. And um, that's all I can say about that. I love that. It's about that feedback loop, trying trial and error and seeing what works. And you just keep going with the flow and you keep modifying as you go. And I, that sounds great. So Samantha, you must have faced some challenges being a woman in finance, a newcomer. I know you had a woman mentor, um, but how did you uh, um, how did you overcome these challenges to be where well, you are today? So um, the biggest challenge for um, any working mom is definitely this kind of uh, work life balance, right? So I'm in a sweet spot now where I have three children that are in college. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm unencumbered. This is a very different place. This is why I can push so hard. Um, but being a, a mother of young children, it would have been very, very different. So I was hiding in the shadows and I was, you know, learning as much as I possibly could and making mistakes and then had to deal with and overcome. And now it's all very public. <laughs> so, um, but, but, but also the, 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 that contrast of time where I would have not put business first, I can now put business first. I, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot different now. So I will admit it's a lot easier for me. Um, luckily I have high energy. I always have high energy. So that's kind of not an issue for me. I can, um, you know, drive projects and, and, um, and drive my very long days and, and not feel worn down by it. But I know that feeling of trying to manage, you know, a household and a business I felt very differently. I was a lot more tired. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's one obstacle. Um, definitely divorce. I mean, that was that was just bone crushing as it related to um, financial you know, security. That was a big deal. So um, that took a few years to kind of recover from that, honestly. So again, I had the kind of the luxury of um, in this business uh, of hiding, right? You can kind of like go away and come back and go away and come back. I don't go away anymore. So this is like, I'm right <laughs> here. 
Um, and there is right now kind of this, this um, traction that I have because I have put forth some goals. And like I said, some of the projects haven't worked out. And then I kind of walk away from it and then I'll re-up it again. Um, and this to me is part of kind of growing a business my way. It doesn't have to be exponential growth, but it has to be um, growth that I am very proud of. And I'm very proud of what I'm, what I have built and what I keep building. So there's a lot of integrity in the product and that matters for me. So, you know, this, this is a journey. This is just not about, um, you know, some touting of like results, results aren't what I focus on. I focus on the process. If, the, if I take care of the process, the results will take care of themselves. Love that. Exactly. I always say focus on the process because um, you spend most of your time in the process anyways. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it. what I'm sensing from you, it's that drive. It's that never giving up. Never. I find that Absolutely. amazing. Have you, no, always, have you always been like this? Um, it depends on the drama, right? So there are times, obviously, emotionally, I think it's a lot easier to kind of get that that sense. Losses are horrible. Um, and then repeating patterns, you create like this reminder of the feeling of loss. So I had to kind of work through, I think, a lot to get to a place where I said, next, next, it's a job. So trading loss is our job. It's literally, it is part of the job. It's like a, like football or, or any ER doctor, you're going to have 100% uh, injury, <laughs> you know, that like you, that you guaranteed you're going to have losses in trading guaranteed. You're going to lose a few that come through the ER door guaranteed. You're going to get hurt um, in, in some, you know, contact sport. So coming to terms with that was a big deal. Um, so I also kind of teach or model that for young traders coming in. Don't you dare give up. Like if you, if you have passion for this, if it's not, if, if it's not your ball game, then fine, you know, but if you have passion for this, if you really want to, um, to, to manifest wealth over the long term, you got to stick with this game. So I think that this is um, kind of one of my, my core beliefs that you have to, um, we all start out as amateurs, right? And so pulling, pulling up, not just women in, in trading and finance, but young people who are coming into this game, 50% of which um, are women who opened up uh, brokerage accounts since COVID. So I'm very excited about this, very excited about this. Half of my staff is women. The next hire will be a woman. So th this whole encouragement, if you will, of don't give up um, is my is definitely my baseline. There's no question about that. Don't give up. Love that. Never give up. Thank you so much, Samantha, for that. <laughs> And full, full of energy you have. I love it. The passion and the energy. It's just amazing and uh, so inspiring for all. So I'd like to go fishing with you now and talk about your macro to micro analysis with your mm -hmm. unique perspective. Please tell us about your approach. It's a little geeky. I'm not sure it'll resonate um, with a lot of folks, but those who have my same worldview of you know, the macro backdrop, they get it uh, a little easier because they come in from the macro with a similar viewpoint of trying to predict what's next. But my intermarket is definitely the kind of secret sauce and the geeky stuff that gives me the conviction, uh, like calling the top, right, in November, December of 21, and I went out on a very verbal, you know, I don't want to know what you want to call it, but um, dance, with interviews and you know big client posts and then big public posts that we were going to have a big drawdown in, in 2022. And all five of my predictions came through because I had high conviction. This year, I don't have such high conviction. I have levels. I have if then. But when I come to a place of high conviction, it's typically because I've done some intermarket analysis, which is the comparison, the contrasting of competing asset classes. And basically, it's ratio analysis where I can kind of see the strength and weakness in particular um, asset classes and how they're going to move technically, move forward to then get behind a particular uh, call, a market direction call, a sector rotation call, a volatility call, an oil call. So this is really um, nuanced and it's something that I just, it's very different from 
uh, macro analysis in its pure form, understanding economics and, and microeconomics. This is something, for example, that Craig Shapiro, who was a longtime client and is now um, manager of our institutional product, Macro Advisor Edge, he can explain the why brilliantly. He ran a hedge fund. So his interpretation of the world based on macro is, is, is very, very um, fine-tuned, right? I am a solid generalist, so I'm using macro and intermarket and technical and quant and fundamental and sentiment and connecting dots. I'm looking for the story that's going to be told chapter by chapter. And a lot of that, believe it or not, is from my intermarket analysis. This is how I get so rabid about a particular um, uh, conviction trade whether it be in summer of 2020, where it was things over paper. I was you know, very, very uh, firm that uh, in August of 2020, that bonds stopped going up and interest rates obviously would rise. And below that, it was going to be commodities and energy outperforming, and then tech would have its distribution and then a pullback in 2022. So those, those relationships are, for me anyway, um, an exercise in patience, waiting for them to set up in my intermarket analysis. And then I can see the inflection points and I'm waiting for a, um, a response, right? The market is going to have some volatility at some key point, key points in time. And I can see when it's, it's getting very, very ready to move. So to me, this is why, and I don't know why, it, why it happened to be me, but why I actually um, am very, very focused on market timing, why I'm known for market timing is because I really care about when volatility comes into an asset class and it will change the direction um, of a move. So that's obviously exciting for me. I like that puzzle piece. <laughs> um, I love that. I, I, you know, I, I joke, I've got a big picture of uh, my kids up on the wall that I became an expert in volatility by raising teenagers. But I really feel that... Um, Volatility, where you study it as a quant, you know, vol selling strategies and quant, you know, um, gamma levels that trigger particular CTA buying and selling. That's all very interesting. And that's all kinds of data, data that helps to give um, support for a directional move. But you need the trigger. I look for the trigger. So that's that's my intermarket stuff. It's it's macro to micro. But it's the intermarket in the middle that actually allows me to connect those two very important um, kind of legs of the table. Legs of the table. You got to have the third. For me, the third is intermarket. I love that. Thank you so much. It's timing is critical. Mm -hmm. You know, if you buy things, no matter how great they are, at the wrong time, you may not do so well. So I think that's key. Timing. And that's amazing how you're able to, to catch those signals, those triggers, as you call them, um, that tell you all this inflection points and everything that's going on. There's so many moving parts. But and that's we're what I get... focus on. I love that. Right. So if, if you don't, I mean, if you're good at what you focus on. That's, that's it in a nutshell. You're good at what you focus mm -hmm. on. So yep. for me, I focus on market timing. I focus on these inflection points. That's my job. So, so it's not to explain the macro so much. It's, you know, um, that's my job. <laughs> so I focus on it. I love it. Well, we're, what you focus on is where your energy goes. So um, awesome. I can't wait to talk about that. Let's first start with the backdrop macro. Mm -hmm. I also have an investing puzzle that I utilize with different parts, fundamentals. I'm, I'm more of a fundamentalist myself. I look at that, I look at sentiment and everything. But to me, like you just said, Macro is the backdrop. Yes. That's the liquidity, the rates, the, the monetary fiscal policies. So, so important. So let's start with that. Inflation. Persistently elevated inflation is a global challenge. I know many like to say it's coming down, but prices are not coming down. There is a deceleration. However, in my opinion, inflation is extremely sticky, especially with the wages, this tight labor market, and these services as services are a function of employment and wages. Um, we also have a very low growth environment. So um, what are your thoughts on inflation and everything that's going on and the disparity 
between what the market thinks and what is really going on? Well, first, it depends on the time zone, uh, time zone, the time frame. So for me, this structural inflation impulse happened in summer of 2020, right? Mm -hmm. This was absolutely, absolutely. floating debt. Um, bonds stopped going up in, in, 20, in August of 2020. And this was just uh, waiting to happen as it relates to inflation percolating higher and bonds pulling down. That was that was really um, a core thesis. OK, bonds are falling. And then in October of 2021, I wrote a long post called deflation of wages ended with covid. So this was a structural view that wages would outperform the increase in wages, the demand, um, wage demand and, uh, you know, ensuing wage increases would actually outperform productivity. That was a 40 year long, you know, trend uh, where productivity had outperformed wages. So I saw this inflection coming in October, wrote about it, and bonds collapsed in 2022, along with stocks. And that was my core thesis that this next wave of a bond crush would, would occur because this wage over productivity was the enemy of bonds. So that was the core thesis. So now fast forward, we're February of 2023, bonds are in trouble. There's no question about that. If you saw me on Twitter not too long ago, I said, um, what, what was the exact phrase that I put? Brace for impact if bond bulls don't defend here. So we're now, what I would say is kind of that phase Three, everyone's getting a little bit more confident, you know, in, in buying bonds because they yield more than, let's say, equities. Mm -hmm. But the point of the matter is they're still not safe. So this is my third leg of the tech fallover, whatever mm -hmm. you call it, rollover, and also the third leg of the bond rollover. I think both of these have yet to happen. So this is, this is again, as it relates to inflation, What's your time frame? Because I can also see right now, this is a gorgeous short-term push higher that we have off the 10-year 3.33, which I also called because that's an inflection point in my intermarket analysis, so, so strong support. So we pushed higher, we're at 3.9 now, but commodities, one after the other, have been rolling over. Mm -hmm. So we do have a deflationary impulse. Oil has yet to you know, flash crash. Um, but the point is, this is then the, we've had these deflation impulses, right? Like we had for um, December CPI, and then that riled the market, animal spirits, whatever, and, and equities moved higher. And we're going to have another deflation impulse. So my point is, I just see waves, I call it waves um, of inflation peaks and equity bottoms. This is going to go on for a while. If I was to put the market in um, kind of a parallel term as far as where we are, I would say we're similar to March 2021 as it relates to equity returns. I do not see attractive risk reward um, to the to the bullish uh, equity market at all. I'm very bearish. This last wonderful momentum thrust was, you know, off January lows. Also saw it very clearly in my intermarket, and we uh, petered out February 2nd, and we have rolled over. We'll have another bounce, but the point is, this is for me still. Um, going down the market, I mean, going down the mountain as far as um, equity returns, it is not a, a rewarding risk um, to go long and expect that we're in a secular bull market for equities. I also don't see us in a very safe place for bonds. So this inflation monster, if you will, that, that, that they <laughs> created through printing, through a massive debt, um, has ended the 40-year bond rally, the end. It's not coming back. I also think it's ended the equity rally. Mm -hmm. um, so this, to me, is structural, but we are still going to have some very solid deflation impulses along the way. And the next one I think that's coming is actually going to be oil and commodities. So um, it depends on the time frame. Wages, without having a serious recession, not a soft one, but a strong one, wage inflation is not going to roll over. So it's going to be much more sticky. Um, but the risks now of recession are being debated. And I'm not calling from, an, it's one thing I don't like to do. I can see inflection definitely in asset classes and in market returns. 
but not in recession odds. So I'll leave that to um, the economists to debate. All I know is I do not think this is attractive risk reward for either bonds or equities. We have a much better return if we just take some of those nice high yielding T-bills and park mm -hmm. it for a little while. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and I've never recommended that before in my life. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have, we have a different set of um, cross currents, I think, for the next few years as it relates to inflation and then the reaction, the Fed reaction and the market reaction. Not very clear, I know, but that's exactly. how I see it. Well said. Uh, the only certainty is uncertainty at, mm -hmm. at this time. And I agree with you. I've been saying the same. Uh, when the risk-free rate is over 5%, um, I don't see, and then, and we also look at the SPX earnings yield is about the same. Uh, might even be a little lower. So, you know, that's why, seven. right? Exactly. Why 4.7? Why take on risk when you can just be in T-bills? And I've been doing the four weeks, you know, for liquidity as well. Um, there's no reason, you know, we're in a vastly different financial environment than we were two years ago. And uh, thank you for going back to 2020, because it's very important, because many people think that it's the tightening that's going to give us problems. It's actually the free money that we had back in 2020, were oh. a lot, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, everything combined. But when the money went to the riskier assets, and now at higher rate, all these companies that have these debts at higher rates, and they need that constant refinance for the capital, um, there mm -hmm. could be defaults occurring. I mean, a lot of issues up, up ahead. So, uh, but I, I'm, I'm curious about the, um, you know, the, the sentiment read waffles back and forth, you know, between economy is strong and we've got defaults mm -hmm. coming. It's so that's very hard for me to kind of follow along. Honestly, what I do have, again, this kind of intermarket look of this, um, you know, debt and uh, rising yields and also very firm dollar, the impact I can see that in the charts is that this is cooked, meaning the market is really, um, for lack of a better word, whistling by the graveyard because of my charts. And then I can go and I can say, okay, Bank of Japan, you know, it's diminishing rate of return with their emergency bond buying. I can see, you know, China stimulus is going to fade and that's going to have less of a, of a, of a push into the global economy. Um, you know, Germany's, you know, industrial recession and the, the constant energy crises that, that bubble up, um, dollar strength shortage, you know, uh, the whole thing. All of these are wonderful narratives, but they don't show me in the charts as clearly as my intermarket. So I am still very much um, a bond and equity bear. And the risk that I see is some trigger coming in that is more focused on Japan's inflation rate versus our CPI prints that are a little bit fudgy. And there's our two, but the point is their inflation that is at 41 year highs, mm -hmm. um, which is going to create the, the, the speculative, you know, massive bond selling over there, which then triggers their higher yields and that triggers global yields higher. And then the reaction over here with the zero DTE, which is the, the, the zero days till empty, I call it destination till empty, but um, days till expiry, excuse me, in the options market that has been nonstop call buying um, in this kind of gamma begets gamma um, flow is now suspectly turning around and they're saying, hey, we can do this on the put side. So the, the trap door becomes very evident to me that bulls could very, very quickly get gored. And, you know, 70% of transactions in the market, in the U.S. market are option driven, not underlying options. And what I look for is very large positioning in underlying stocks further out in time that is kind of a, a, a stake, if you will. They're coming in and they're, they're putting in some, um, some wood here into a position. Those are so far and few now. They're, they're, they, they, they compress the time and they're playing the games, both retail and hedge funds, in these zero DTE or zero to two day um, expiry options. And that will also trigger some risk off 
because they're not paying attention to what's going on with Bank of Japan, for example. So for me, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the related parts of liquidity in the market, net buying or selling, dollar, obviously that's a tailwind or headwind, and yields. And of all three, yields. So I focus very much on that um, on every time frame. And I think that's probably um, the most important macro consideration that I have to help keep clients on the right side of the trade and when we're going to have potential risk. To, so to position for that risk. Absolutely. This will take time. As you said, I think it could definitely take quite a few years. So this intermarket analysis is key. Now, when you look at the accumulation and distribution, I mean, obviously we're little fish in the big sea of all these institutions. Um, what are you seeing? Are you seeing buying by institutions? Are you seeing more of a short covering? Um, you know, what, oh, what, yeah. what are you seeing? This recent rally was no question short covering. I mean, that was that was very clear. It's done. The short covering was done. I tweeted that out, but the the Fact is some real buyers did come in as well, a lot of retail, but some real buyers came in as well, but still not the positioning, the solid institutional positioning that we need to really create um, a durable bottom. And we're also, the market's still overvalued as mm -hmm. it relates to everything, by the way, um, both growth and cyclical um, trades. So we, we have right now a potential for some more serious downside um, depending on, again, what's the trigger? Earnings were kind of over that hump for Q4. Some companies gave guidance. We already know that was a, a very poor showing for Q4 and the market didn't really take it down. Why? Because we had massive central bank intervention in mid-October. And that's the liquidity that I also study from the macro to operationalize that to a bullish or bearish trade. So for example, and I, I, I've talked about this, I've tweeted about this, but I, I can't, underestimate how how powerful liquidity is to market returns. So if um, Treasury Secretary Yellen comes in on October 12th and says that she's worried uh, about Treasury liquidity and so she's going to she's going to focus on that and then there's a massive reversal on October 13th, then you have October 21st in broad daylight on a Friday morning because I we caught it live in our live in my live trading room. You have Bank of Japan come in with a massive yen intervention, again, safeguarding their bonds. And it was not the first time. It was the second time since September 22nd, the, which had been the first time in 22 years they came in. Then you had them follow up on October 24th. Then you had China the next day order their state banks to stem the sale of their stock market and they came in and bought up their issues over in China, which obviously lit a fire all combined, not to mention Swiss National, uh, Swiss National, uh, SNB um, came in with a, a $18 billion US dollar swap with the Fed. Again, all of this central bank intervention is absolutely coordinated, all came around the same time. And then what did shorts have to do? They had to cover. I mean, the, the K-Web contingencies, the Chinese ADRs had been massively, you know, over um, shorted, shorted. They were beautiful. They were beautiful. So that just basically triggers first short covering and then FOMO chasing. Then you also have the, the fear of under uh, materially underperforming in funds. So it, it basically set off a lot of net buying. And I can see that. So I can see net buying. I can see net selling. There's usually a macro trigger. I can also find out in my intermarket when it's, I'm, I'm looking for it. Like when's it, it's gonna come, it's gonna come. I need a few more days or a few more weeks or a few more months, but it's coming. <laughs> so this is what was the reason for the market bounce that we had of size since October. Now the, it's diminishing returns, however, when you have a central bank intervene, unless they wanna keep putting liquidity in. And you also have a lot of shorts that cover and then you need real buyers to step up. That's the trick right now. So this is done. <laughs> this, this, um, uh, this safety of the Fed will have our backs. They're still hiking. They're still absolutely behind the curve, right? Trying to play catch up. 
there's fear of over hiking. The whole thing is just a mess because they're trapped and debt is ginormous and our political landscape is a bloody mess. So for me, it's only the swings or the chases, and I consider it kind of three time frames: chase, swing, and trend, that matter as far as my perspective on identifying when liquidity comes in and comes out. So this is, it's very tradable, but you need to know what to look for. And so I very much focus on um, liquidity, macro central bank intervention. I also focus on net buying and selling indicators on multiple time frames. I'm always watching the dollar and the yen. Um, and I'm always watching yields and the reaction to Fed announcements. So that's pretty much all I need to be able to um, give some really good guidance to clients. And then I ask them, what are you trading? What's your time frame? You know, <laughs> and help them set it up. So that's basically um, what I do. Love that. Thank you so much for that. Now, um, the bond yields are critical. I know I saw a tweet from you, I believe, that said that you're looking at a certain level for the 10 year. Yes. And you're also looking at a certain level. I think it was over 106 for Dixie for the dollar. And um, at that point, you'll have more certainty about the direction. Could you tell us about what you're seeing at those specific points? Yeah, the dollar, uh, well, obviously, um, more tightening by the Fed is going to create um, more uh, rotation into the dollar. So it, this current structure in the Dixie is a head and shoulders pattern. So a lot of folks are really excited about this breaking back down. We're just having a bounce right now from 101 to 105. So if we get up to 106, sure, not hard to imagine. But then I think the crowd is very much expecting a solid 10% pullback in the dollar. Um, and I can see the head and shoulders. And I don't even know if folks even technically analyze Dixie as such, but they're still expecting the dollar to fall and markets to get bid up because obviously it's a tailwind for bulls if the dollar comes down. I'm seeing this as a period of digestion. Yields obviously are strong with dollar and the Fed is, is very focused on um, you know, staying the course. So that wasn't priced in, right? The only Fed cuts were priced in, not Fed hikes. So and that was what I expected to come back because I'm following inflation. But for right now, if Dixie does get above 106, that would be the shock because it's not priced in. So they're expecting dollar to just have this little bounce and then break back lower, break that 101, fall down to 98, and bulls are off and, and running. I'm not convinced of that. Um, head and shoulders can also be continuation patterns. They can be very bullish. The problem is timing is key, right? And so admittedly, I don't know uh, when and if we're going to break 106. I do know it's going to be a shock if we do. <laughs> so it's more of let's play, you know, the, the, the shorter duration moves. Those are a lot uh, more manageable, if you will, because I can see net buying or selling. I can see the, the dollar um, and yields, you know, on this, on this kind of shorter duration. But bigger picture, I'm going to let that play out. Is it, in fact a head and shoulders and it, it drops another 10%, um, or are we going to get a, a solid rotation higher in the dollar? That'd be very um, uh, depressing for commodities, okay? And that includes gold and oil and the rest. We absolutely have had some commodities uh, come back down um, of late. Oil hasn't really moved out of its corridor um, between that kind of you know 70 to 80 um, channel uh, surfing that it's doing. So the dollar matters. It, it matters as it relates to earnings. It matters as it relates to commodities, which right now, you know, had been where a lot of folks were, were holding out um, in profitable energy trades, especially in oil and gas. They're still printing. They're still printing beautiful pro um, profits, even though investments are a little uh, thin because of administration not really giving a, a, a strong support. Nonetheless, this is where profit taking is also likely we get a little drawdown in um in oil then the oil and gas plays which like i said lots of folks are holding out there because it was an outperformer last year they can very quickly exit so that would create some instability as well for the for the market so for me it's always a rotation growth to value value to growth there's a there's a sector rotation always 
I'm looking for it every day. I've got a hundred, you know, ETFs and I'm sizing up where the money is rotating. Um, and in lieu of sector rotation, that's when volatility hits. That's what we had the past few days. So they weren't rotating to energy. They weren't rotating to growth. They were getting out of dodge and volatility spiked a good 28%. So that is why, um, uh, personally, I think sector rotation is extremely valuable for anyone who's learning to trade because there's always a bull market somewhere. Mm -hmm. And when there isn't, that's when volatility comes in and reprices everything. Love that. Thank you so much. I agree with you. There's always a bull market somewhere. And I think it would be great if we talk about the diverse asset classes. I see you trade across all asset classes. So first of all, let's go with the value and growth. And now we know the SPYV versus the SPYG. Last year, we saw since November of 21, we saw that value appreciated against growth. Mm -hmm. Are you believing that that will continue into this year? Or do you think we could see a rotation back to growth at any time soon? So I had a very strong opinion about this la at the beginning of last year, that, and I literally wrote about it, that this um, the value rotation would continue. Energy would outperform. I had a, a $130 crude oil target for March of 2022, and it hit. Um, now, moving forward, okay, growth to me does not interest me at all. Not the, not the Bitcoins of the world, not the tech, not mega cap not mid-tier tech, not oversold tech. When we have a short duration, short covering rally like we've had from January, it's so tradable, but investable, no. So what I actually like to do is I go and I have, um, again, chase, swing, and trend time frame. Within the trend time frame, I have a, a, a proprietary scan and I come up with, a, a, against 7,500 stocks in the universe, um, my scan of the strongest sector leaders. So I'm looking at, again, sector rotation matters to me, but I'm this is all a trend long only, by the way, trend long only um, portfolio. So I find the, 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 and watch sector rotation. And then I look for the outperformers. Again, there's technical. I look at the fundamentals. I'm looking at the macro back backdrop. I'm letting clients know my top 30 list, for example, um, and they're carried over. So they're they're only closed when they break the rules, right? Um, and then this is my new 2023. This, this is the group that I think is going to outperform for 2023. And there are times where I have to say, protect, protect, right? So I'm a big energy bull, big picture, but the easy money was made, right? From November of 2020, um, all the way through until literally just recently, we've had an, a, a, a wonderful you know, uh, run. But I don't think that there is a solid outperformance in growth or value this year, right? I think we're going to muddle through. So even though I have, by the way, the, the 30 that I mentioned that were carried over from the past two years and the, the new 30, my top 30 for 2023, they're all value. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's like one biotech. Um, um, I, I couldn't even get on the, there were a few that came up on my scan very strongly that were semiconductors, but I'm like, yeah, no, I don't trust that. So I'm very, very discriminating when it comes to picking the, the leadership for the coming year. And I don't see growth outperforming. I see things still things over paper, the better bet. Um, so in other words, real cash flow, you know, like you know, real assets, right? Not, not, not paper assets, um, and not exponential growth craziness, not AI. Um, that's a bottom fishing play. So anyone who wants to go into a speculative, uh, sector such as AI or, um, you know, crypto, you need to know that industry really, really well, and maybe be patient because there's a lot of overhang, right? With this kind of growth scare that we've had for really good reasons. You want, it's really whole, hard to hold a high multiple growth play in a Fed hiking regime. It's not so logical. So you have to have a really high conviction for what I call the bottom fishing plays. I rather go with the trend leaders and identify the top um, plays in this space, which happens 
to be a lot of value, mm -hmm. but I'm not expecting as great returns relative to the energy plays that I picked for clients in January of 2022. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Because okay. as we said before, the only certainty is uncertainty. And at this point, equities and bonds, uh, I mean, I'm also very bearish on them, you know, and I think it's going to be a challenging year plus. Mm -hmm. So um, when plus. we talk, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I also, um, I, I agree that cash is king. And when you have higher rates and that debt that carries, that, car that companies carry is going to be at a much higher rate. I mean, we margins are already compressed. And they're only going to get further compressed as the, there's a rise in rates. And that I believe I'm that. very rate bullish. There's no question about it. Even if we have a hardship, I still see higher yields. Absolutely. Especially yeah. with the strong labor market that we have. Uh, the Fed does not have any incentive right now to not continue raising rates. Um, so I am not in the camp of any cuts anytime soon. I think you would agree that uh, we're probably not going to see any cuts this year, right? Unless we had some kind of very big shock, but then I think that would be a mistake because this is very much a trapped Fed and every even, you know, intonation of fiscal stimulus makes, you know, yields pop up like a daisy. So we really don't have a way, I don't think anyway, I'm not seeing it, um, to inflate this debt uh, with lower yields. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we're, um, we have risk of recession, but economic backdrop is still pretty darn strong. People spending, right? Mm -hmm. You know, unemployment so low. Could we have a debt ceiling snafu? That would change everything. Um, I have a baseline bet, like 3.33 to be exact on the 10 year. Above is inflation, below is deflation. And I don't mean that big picture for years. I'm talking about the impulse. We can have an, uh, an inflation impulse. We can have an inflation, uh, a deflation impulse. But for the most part, that's really going to be um, harder to get below 3.33% in the 10 year without an event. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it goes higher, in my opinion, especially with this Fed's rate hiking cycle that most likely will continue. Um, and, you know, we talk about margins being compressed, but now this debt is going to be at a higher cost. There's higher cost of production. Labor, we know, is already elevated. Productivity is down. There's a dilution of value. So like you said, value, well said. if you have to have the lesser of the two evils in the stocks, you know, <laughs> then value where there's at least cash, there's real cash there, um, seems to present a better opportunity. So that, like you're talking about sector rotation. I love those terms. Where are you seeing the rotation into, please? So this is, th this momentum thrust rally that we had from January 5th in my momentum, you know, uh, intermarket review, petered out February 2nd, and then it rolled over. And I gave that warning on the 16th, it's time. And we have pulled back. So we will have a little bit more. And then I think we're going to have a bounce. And then we'll have to see how strong that bounce is. Because you got still lots of speculation. You still got lots of um, potential Fed intervention or otherwise, right? Bank of Japan did an unscheduled bond buying today just to try and tap down um, their uh, yields from popping above their cap. So there's always going to be some attempt. The question is how successful. I see it as diminishing rate of return. So that keeps me on guard. That keeps me watching the macro. It keeps me, you know, sizing up the intermarket. I don't think that this particular um, rollover is done. I presented that to clients this morning saying, yeah, this is, this is going to be a little bit more. And then we're going to have to see how serious it is because I've got some very key levels. We can either retest and bounce meaning the market, or we're going to trounce those levels. And then it's a whole new risk paradigm moving forward. No question in my mind. So we're right at an inflection point, which is really nerve wracking for some. And I'm excited. Like I, I, I know exactly what I'm looking for. So that's kind of how I work. I either have high conviction um, when it, and I'm looking for something to happen, right? I don't know. Like, I don't know anything about crypto. Sorry, I, I, I know it's a liquidity trade. I know it's tradable, but I don't know anything about 
Bitcoin and I've said it for years. Even when my son, you know, in 2017 is like, mom, we got to buy some crypto. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, if I don't know, I will say I have no idea. Everything else is if then. So I have a, an if then statement on the market that right now, that inflection point that I'm watching very, very carefully. And then even lower, if we if we trounce 3,600, now we're not there right now, we're 4,000. But if we trounce 3,600, I have a, a, a high conviction that it's going to be really tough to get back above that. So that's a worry, right? Because we don't want that. We, we really, we, I'd rather muddle through and, you know, for another year and give some time for the governments to kind of figure it out and, and companies to stabilize and, and debt ceiling and all that jazz. But for right now, it, it seems a little bit um, too uh, unsuspecting. In other words, the market is getting all bold up again. And I'm like, but Why? Like I wake up happy every day. I'm looking for good things to happen. I don't see anything in my charts that say we're done going down. So I'm I'm biding my time until I can kind of see that trigger again. But that'll be confirmation that we're going to have another uh, 2022, basically, with some very sharp pullbacks that will take out some really key levels. And um, the investors, I don't think have have too much interest in this market right now, big picture. I think some have come in, but big picture, they're still waiting to see what's going to happen. And they're paid to wait, as we've already mm -hmm. talked about. So Absolutely. they're paid to wait. Let's see what the Fed's going to do. Let's just, you know, let's see what happens. Um, I, but I'm just seeing right now the the, the interday or the multi-week, you know, momentum uh, trades are short-lived. So mm -hmm. that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm not a bull. <laughs> I appreciate that, Samantha. <laughs> Samantha, you have made some amazing calls. I have to say, I remember last year reading one of your fish stories. Um, it's a very cute website you have. I know you're revamping it now into a whole new one, but I love your whole fishing motif and your fish stories. And I remember you saying how you you made these calls about oil, about where the market was going. And um, so I really, truly value your input here. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Um, absolutely. I agree with you. You know, SPX um, is pricey, you know, QQQ, you know, the NASDAQ is pricey. Valuations and price need to come down. We can look at the equity risk premium, um, but we know, I mean, the PE, I think right now is about 18 and um, many are saying calling for a 14 or 15. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we can't predict, but we, we can both say it is expensive and there is probably another leg down ahead of us. And uh, I agree with you on that. So with that in mind, let's talk about other asset classes. We did talk a little bit. We mentioned commodities. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know your thoughts about gold. And you made a great call as well in January. I think at the end of January, you were saying how you were going to take profits on it. Good for you because it has pulled back. Um, what are your thoughts on the metals, agriculture, sugar, coffee, and all that? I don't actually spend so much. I have a, a, a full-time commodities trader who focuses on soft commodities. I really don't sugar coffee because they're not really so tradable. I mean, the ETFs and the, and the underlying, if you're really into that, but oh, gold. Oh yeah. I, that's my, my thing. Tell us <laughs> so, about that. <laughs> gold and oil. Oh yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about those so the cows come home. Um, so this was actually, um, okay. Going into that call, I didn't look so, so strong, meaning when GLD, for example, was 154, I said, okay, this is a really strong area of support, but gold is still in a downtrend, right? From literally August 20 of 20, gold and bonds stopped going up. So I said, but it, we can have a solid bounce, no question. And it happened at the same time, all the central bank intervention came in. So literally Dixie topped out at $114.77 and then pulled back a good 10, you know, 11%. And that gave the wind to the sales of the gold bulls. So, okay, we're going to get up to, let's see, 164. Hmm, held pretty well. 174. Hmm, not too bad. There's a gap fill at 180, 179 and change. The point is it got there. Once it got there, I actually went on Bloomberg. It was on January 23rd or something. And I said, okay, protect, that, that, that was the long, now protect gold, um, protect those those longs, because I'm not convinced it's 
going to stay up here so easily. And I forget, I went on again and I said, yeah, this is now a short. And to like, whatever it was, 1895, anyway, or 174 GLD. Well, the day after FOMC, gold dumped and it wasn't a little shallow pullback. I actually had talked about this in a podcast too, because I said, I'm waiting for gold to pull back. I hope it's shallow <laughs> because it would set up brilliantly for this year for precious metals to really run. And it would also support that kind of um, after a bounce in the dollar, a pullback to that 98 Dixie. And that would also be very supportive for um, precious metals, gold, silver miners. Well, no, 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 that thing dumped. And I remember I had it live and um, I said, this is this is a scary dump. This is not a shallow dump. Someone wants the heck out. This is a this is a reversal. This is going to go a while. So gold has continued to fall with silver and miners. And yes, they can have these, you know, one day or maybe two day um, bounces. But unfortunately, it's nearing a level of concern for any trend long gold player. And it still has to work itself out, right? And right now, there is a lot that is um, paired with gold and yen. So they they, they tend to um, have a parallel kind of trading scheme. I actually, I call that a, a basket trade. Back in October, I said um, long yen, because Bank of Japan came in on the 21st, long gold, bonds will stop going down and market will get supported because, you know, it's going to pull dollar down with, you know, with this bounce um, so that all worked really well, but when gold pulled back in the last, it, it pulled back really hard. They're dumping mm -hmm. gold. They're dumping gold. And then that's when I get like the spidey sense is going, what the heck's going on? Now it wasn't just the dollar bounce at 101, which was gorgeous. It was bigger than that. So I'm actually getting bearish commodities. I've seen, you know, some commodities sell off a little bit harder than usual. Nat gas is in a, its own little world. Um, lots of nat gas, it just has no place to go. <laughs> Oil right now is very hard because I have no interest in it. It's just snaking sideways. But I think I see a flash crash kind of setting up for oil. Um, in the same way that I saw a pullback in gold, but that actually was a flash crash. So I'm wondering if commodities are going to come under some uh, oil and gold are going to come under even more distribution. Um, I think they will get defended, but they're not there yet. So not even a 200 day looks like it's going to save um, either of these. They look to me um, like they're being sold. So there's uh, th that's all I can say. That right now, they are still shorts. I don't have um, a bottom yet that I see that is safe for uh, either oil. I, oil I do, 65, 65 and crude but it's got to get there first. So yeah, I don't I don't have a particularly bullish take on commodities right now. And obviously uh, dollar has been firm and rising. Yields have been firm and rising. So I think we can have some uh, digestion period, but I don't think either oil um, nor gold are um, high conviction longs. I wouldn't, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Mm, interesting. Thank you. There's a lot of talk about stagflation being a possibility at some point this year or the next few years. And historically, uh, we always think of metals and gold being, you know, appreciating in those type of environments. And of course, nowadays, there's new inflation protected, there are ETFs out mm -hmm. there um, that, uh, that are protection against inflation. What are your thoughts on any of those? Are you looking at any of those or any fixed income, AAA, like CLOs or, or anything like that? No, I'm not. So Craig manages the, the, the product that is very much focused or the service, and he could talk to all of those wonderful tools, right? So fixed income, um, money managers, they love that, really. That's their, that's their wheelhouse. I am much more on the moment, right? I'm looking for volatility to come in and play a directional move. So safety or 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 putting money into something that doesn't have um, a, a lot of alpha <laughs> for me, mm -hmm. it, it just isn't so interesting. So I love that I can see that cash, we're paid to wait, right? T-bills are a nice place to go. Um, but as it relates to managing a book and allocating to fixed income, that's a much, much better question for Craig. For me, I'm looking at, and squarely, 
how safe is this for clients to come in and enter um you know the energy sector right now what's your time frame you know the, these value plays what's your time frame these growth plays that seem to be pop, popping up because they're you know oversold they've been in a, in a, in a protracted downtrend and now they might have had an earnings release that's getting folks excited um so i'm very differently focused on equities and very much on rates and dollar but not so much on a, 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 the the fixed income uh, and uh, or or credit markets for that matter. So that's a that's a very different mm -hmm. focus, and it's not mine. Yeah. I love that. That's just like Warren Buffett says: trade, invest with what you know, mm -hmm. and that's what you focus on. I love that you delegate that to Craig. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for for telling us about that. Now I want to go into the VIX. I know that's something you know quite well. And uh, if you could tell us what you're seeing with volatility right now. I mean, it's surprising, in my opinion, it's it's been low. And, you know, I would ex have expected a, more of a spike at some point. I know all the end of last year, people were talking, they were trying to buy calls in UVIXI and, and they were saying, oh, you know, it's going to it's going to have to have that big spike to to, mm -hmm. you know, the VIX has to go to 40. What are your thoughts on all that? Do you think it's still a meaningful indicator and that it will have that spike when we get that, maybe that next leg down lower? So I, I wish I could uh, uh, show you a chart that would very much express my view of volatility, but I take it on a wide angle, first and foremost, um, in, a, in a stock bond volatility mm -hmm. ratio that I created basically to identify when the market is bullish when the market is bearish. So it's basically, it helps me stay on the right side of the trend and share that with clients. Then I kind of drill in, I zoom in a little bit and I'm like, okay, so now we got some patterns that are forming in this ratio. Again, this is intermarket that says we're going to have a potential um, volatility surge, which is exactly what I wrote to clients last Thursday, the 16th, because I could see it starting to come up. So uh, again, this was the intermarket and it, it rose, you know, what, 28%. But that's not to say this is a great hedge. No, it's a, I'm using it to time directional moves, right? So the, the, the volatility suppression players, they sell VIX because of the high, you know, rich IV. Um, they don't, they, they disappeared after Volmageddon in 2018, but then they have come back and there's just, it's, there's, I'm not so excited about trading VIX, the vehicle per se, um, you know, this, is important because a 16% move in VIX equates to 1% in the SPY, that's more interesting to me. So I want to be able to basket trade um, a movement, a directional movement in an index and all the corresponding players underneath it that have even a higher beta. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. I don't use VIX as much of anything, but to let me know with my ratio if the market is bullish or bearish or at risk. So one particular chart that I have shows this indicator that I, so I overlay this ratio and I'm getting geeky, but just try and envision this. I overlay this ratio over an indicator that I've cherry picked over the years. And when it flatlines, when the indicator flatlines is when we have a lot of volatility that year, like a wide swath of volatility, like event driven volatility. And then typically the indicator goes back down and that's when the market's bullish again. Mm. So it's it's one of these deals where it's a smoothing indicator, but when it flatlines, it's like, ooh, careful. <laughs> what are you seeing right now? We just, I just saw it. So I thought, and that's why I warned. Mm -hmm. Do you, I don't know if you saw me on Twitter, but I, on no, Thursday I said, yeah, I said, it's time. <laughs> ah, wow. So, I have my my um my secret sauce, and that's what clients are paying for. It's that's my awesome. read of the market, mm -hmm. and I have ten contributors. Like I'm not the only game in town here, but the the fact is that this is my job is market timing. So I use these indicators as best I can to identify when volatility comes in, um, when rotation comes in, when liquidity comes in, and where the dollar and yields are going, and that's my job. And then I have other folks who are domain experts, right? Craig, hedge fund manager, macro. He can explain it better than, than most. It's it's a beautiful thing. He can write about it, explain about it and, and help clients, you know, capture it. Um, and then I have a whole desk 
of, of traders who are specializing in, you know, maybe futures or like commodities or just oil or, you know, advanced options. So I, we, we kind of like collaborate, but for the most part, I'm sticking with my geeky intermarket stuff to time moves in the market, fixed income, that's somebody else. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I, I, I like this game. Mm -hmm. Great. You seem to delegate very well. I love that you have all these experts in their field and then you take a little bit from all of them. Oh God. And then yes. you, you create your own intermarket analysis. So Absolutely. please, we want to hear from you. You're an expert in intermarket analysis and you're a true entrepreneur as well. And that is admirable. Please, Samantha, tell us, tell us about your time frames, what, how you're positioning yourself at this time? Are you more to the bullish side? Are you more to the bearish side with your short-term trading and the momentum? What are you seeing out there? And please tell us about the different time frames that you focus on. Okay. So chase, swing, and trend. Chase, for some, they day trade, they go to cash at the end of the day. Chase for me, that would define a chase. Could be intraday, could be a few days. Swing is a few weeks. It could turn into longer, can turn into many more weeks. Um, it can turn into months, but it typically is a move that I'm anticipating that will happen in the next few weeks. So um, uh, trend is different. Trend is a multi-month type of rotation, and it's already in play. It's already kind of proven itself. And now the, the, the point is kind of hopping on that train or that trend and knowing when to get off and then not getting off until it breaks the rules. So trend is something, it doesn't take a lot of management. It really doesn't. I look at it once a week. Um, swings are much more active because they either work or they don't. And then I think the chases are the, the thing that the market gets so excited about making a call for a particular day, but that is not so exciting to me. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, ah, it's a distraction to the big picture. If I'm just doing chase you know, type of analysis and trading that I can't really focus on all the macro backdrop, go through all the intermarket, right? So I'm not focused on one particular time frame. I like to look um, across chase swing and time frame. I like to compare what's happening across the asset classes from, you know, even crypto, um, but especially currencies, bonds, um, and commodities, and of course, equities. I'm very focused on U.S., but I'll look at the major, um, you know, Germany got extremely excited of late. I think that's um, a tipping point. <laughs> um, Japan, China, although their markets are um, highly uh, controlled. So for me, it's not really, um, it, it's not fixed. I, I have the fixed trends and then I check in to see if they're still working. And then I have a lot of variability in swings. I have to wait, like, are they, are they setting up? Is it is it going to be um, uh, the best uh, horse? Am I picking the best horse, basically? But I'm going to give it more room. So in options parlay, that means you kind of go out in time a few months on your options versus uh, weeklies or nearer dated um, monthlies, which is very much kind of the the chase time frame. So yeah, that's it. I, I use right now um, my directional call to say, all right, I'm short term market bearish. We've had that volatility spike and a pullback. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a short term bounce, but we also have some macro events coming in. PCE uh, comes in on, um, on Friday. Um, we have you know, the FOMC minutes weren't very much, but that could have been um, a hawkish read. It wasn't. So the point is there are always going to be some market moving news. And I'm going to be wanting to focus on that for the short duration trades, but they're not really going to make any difference to the swings or the trends. That makes sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so but much. But no, I am that. I'm definitely bearish right now, but I'm I'm waiting for those key inflection points to trigger and what could be the trigger always looking for that kind of narrative or it's story. Exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, that's the puzzle. It's a puzzle. It's exciting. Um, so technical. So you're an excellent technical analyst. So please tell us what type of indica indicators do you prefer on your charts? I love stochastics. Um, so I have basically uh, 
two screens of indicators. One screen I show clients in my live trading room and really what they're seeing is a, an hour, a day and a week time frame with stochastics on the bottom. That's the cleanest I can possibly get. Stochastics to me is a, it's an oscillator that's more leading than lagging. And there are particular inflection points on the um, oscillator that help me identify the direction, whether it be intraday or what I call the intraday, the hour chart is that chase time frame. Um, the swing time frame is the daily and then the trend is the weekly. So I really like that, that's clean. But then on the other side where clients can't see, <laughs> I have secret sauce. I have, um, oh my goodness, I've got so many, in so many indicators and I'm scanning them very, very quickly just to see if there's a, a divergence. Um, I mean, my goodness, pivot points, Copic curve, moving averages, trend lines. There's a lot, right? But I don't have, I'm not married to any of them. I consider it kind of like counting cards. So if I have two out of five, eh, it's not very good risk reward. Three out of three, it's better. Four out of four, that's worth a trade. Five out of five is, is rare. That's a unicorn. So my point is I like to use lots of views of the same thing also. So when I close my trading room and in the afternoon, I'm looking at um, not just the um, the charting software that I'm I'm sharing with clients, but I'm looking at my, my stock charts. I'm looking at trading view. I'm looking at monthly, weekly. Um, I've got on different... I will go through hundreds of charts at the end of the day of my key, you know, asset class and intermarket charts just to scan it to see if there's anything in, the, in those indicators that I can pick up um, for directional tells. So the one that I definitely show the most is just a straight stochast stochastics mm -hmm. oscillator, but I have more that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it gives me more conviction basically so that when I'm making a call um, that I have more kind of more cards, if you will, um, that I've counted that are in my favor. Very nice. You leave no stone unturned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, curious. Just call it curious. Great. And full of energy. So you just keep looking at all the time frames and charts. I love all the indicators and um, stochastics. I agree. Uh, excellent, excellent indicator. Okay, so my another question I have regarding um, your positioning right now, would you say you're holding more cash than you were in the past due to all this uncertainty that we have in 2023? Oh, 100%. 100%. There's, there's, I have three modes of operation, high conviction, um, if then, and I don't know. <laughs> so, and right now, the, um, the in, you know, instability of this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, risk reward for me is enough reason. If I don't have conviction bullish, I, I can't, I can't do it. So this to me is going to be culminating sooner rather than later. I like to just wait until I have confirmation. That's basically Absolutely. in a nutshell. Right now you can see the bond market. You can see the oil market. You know, you can see this digestion and this churn. Um, big picture, the market also has just been gyrating, right? We're not at the highs, we're not at the lows, we're like 50% in the middle, right? So we really have not gone anywhere fast if you were to zoom out. So there isn't a lot of conviction, bullish or bearish. We've just chopped sideways, literally, since about April of last year. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've taken out some, you know, some important lows, um, we haven't gotten above, you know, 4,300 in that, in that um, uh, uh, April rally, but it's not big picture at all a setup for bulls, but the bears can't feast yet either. <laughs> yeah. so, shorter time frame, and you, you'll have a much higher conviction, um, but not on a zero or two day, you know, expir expiring option. That's mm -hmm. just, that's absolute foolishness to me. I don't, I don't get that. Absolutely. So thank that's you. My thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes a lot. I agree. I don't trade those as well. I'm also an options trader, but I don't do the zero or the two or any DTE like that. I like to cool. give myself time. At least if I, I have a rule when I buy, I try to go three months plus when yes, I sell. I six. Yeah. Right. 
And yep. when I sell, because I love selling for premium, I'm more of a credit um, uh, options yeah. myself, right? I love right. doing shorter term. And there's a sweet spot lately. I've been doing uh, about three weeks. I like two, three. Like, I don't like same week because the premium isn't as good. So um, the VIX is lower. So the IV is a little lower. So um, I do three weeks and I, I've been doing up to two, three months and I'm okay with that. Um, you know, and uh, it works and I love selling cover calls on my longs. And uh, I also sell, I do credit spreads on the put side as well. But yeah, if this, uh, we get a little bounce, that's nice. And we'll see it's, it's short term action. Like you said, I love the way you phrase that, you know, the chase you call it. And I there's do. always <laughs> momentum in that little small window. But when you zoom out and you look at for the year, I mean, there's just so much uncertainty to, to choose a direction. And I'm not an earnings player. Like people love to, like, what do you think about this? What Like NVIDIA is going to report yeah. and I have no edge, right? So it's, for me, an earnings play is an advanced option play. Sellers win. <laughs> Buyers typically and Absolutely, because of the high IV during <laughs> yeah. the earnings and yeah. the, 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 those few days. And uh, I always, if I do anything, I sell. Um, but yeah, I mean, the earnings are, you know, it's all about market reaction about the buyers and sellers and, and the people. And we, it's like, we're gambling. Because yeah, I don't. Did, that's right? just my my nerve wracking kind of mentality is that it, it can go against, and it's happened to me before. <laughs> so oh, yeah, it I don't want to have the drama. I hate drama. The older I get, the less drama I want. So mm -hmm. um, that I don't do earnings, but I have li literally just a dedicated um, advanced options trader who gives clients the earnings setup if they want it because they ask me. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no edge. I'm happy yeah. to trade it after. I'm at, I'm happy to yes. size it up after the fact. There's so much more meat on left on the bone after that IV crush. But going in there ahead of time, unless I have a really really high conviction, to me it is just a lotto, and that yes. is not Absolutely. positioning. That's just kind of adrenaline. So I love that. Well, this is perfect segue to risk management. Mm. Please tell us about your mindset because risk management is more than just a little stop loss. It's a yeah. whole mindset and risk management is number one. So please tell us what your thoughts are on that. I have um, two kind of rolling mantras and they're in my mind and they're also spoken to anyone who asks and that is risk happens when you don't know what you're doing. Number one. And don't risk anything more than you're willing to lose. And that's the framework. Um, that's about it, and, you know, as far as that kind of broad strokes. But then everyone has to take on their own personal risk management. And that's the one thing I really respect about clients. So they might, uh, you know, ask for my analysis to set up a trade, but they're the ones that are responsible for adding whatever overlay, right, of options or time or exit and you know trim and uh, entry trim and exit so ultimately they they know they have to be responsible for their own trades and i really really i value how hard it is to be um a trader or a money manager especially with the noise and with the chop so it's it's hard work it's hard work so they have to come up with their own kind of modality of how they're going to trade i have mine um, on the chase, it's typically going out, um, like you said, kind of like the, the the two or three weeks for me, that's, um, it's not, it's not going to be a two or three day thing unless I have an extremely rare light bulb go off. <laughs> like a oh, five, oh. right? The unicorn five, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and swing typically one to three months and then trends three to six month out option. And then they just get rolled. Also call spreads if mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to happen right away. And that's probably the most frustrating thing is um, I want to be right, but timing is key. So I'm usually really good on direction, but timing is so hard. So, you know, th that's the, 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 the reality of trading directionally, because that's what I am, right? I'm a directional trader and, you know, manifesting a trade using directional options or spreads or a, a financed call spread or put spread is very much dependent on me being right. Selling options is what some like to do because they don't have to be so right on direction. There are lots of ways to win. But to me, it's it's just not comfortable. What can I tell you? It's just not my baseline um, um, mode. So th that is how I manage risk is using options, number one, 
um, the timing, right? How much time to add? Am I realistically going to get to that price target um, with the dates of that option? <laughs> so realistically, probably not, add some. <laughs> so add some yes. time um, and not swing in large. So I happen to have a, a, a problem, which is over trading. So that's actually, and then not paying attention because I get distracted. So having too many positions, having too big size, I'm going to just turn into a bitch. So this is not good for me. So I know what's not good for me. And that's not being able to manage my risk. The end, the end. Nobody wants to be around me if I can't manage my risk. So um, that's it. Smaller size. It. It's smaller size, like one to three percent of available equity. So th I th that's me. But then I'm not just trading. I'm like literally running a trading business. <laughs> I've got, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's a lot. It, it's but I love this. That's the entrepreneurial side. Mm -hmm. So being able to um, grow a business. I've got a brokerage triggered trade alert uh, fintech product under development. I've got a new website rebranding under development. I'm trying to get some risk indicators um, off the ground again. Had launched them two years ago. The platform uh, provider went under and I just, it was too busy. Um, I have, you know, new contributors, products, um, uh, clients, Twitter. <laughs> I, I love, love this. Podcasts, interviews. I love this. But this is not me hiding out all by myself, just trading full time. So um, this is better for me. I like this, this um, kind of like really being kind of forced to kind of hone in on what I'm good at. And then I have to, I make a call and I'm kind of stuck with it. There's accountability, right? So whether it's on Twitter or Bloomberg, it's, it's accountability. So it all makes me a better analyst, educator, and trader. Love it. So positive. Your energy is just contagious. I love it. I feel like Oh, it's just so exciting. You make it so exciting. And, you know, it's, um, you know, knowing yourself, you said a very key, that's key, knowing yourself, you yeah. know what your strengths are, and you know, your weaknesses, everyone has their own personal risk tolerance. And like you said, you had your clients come up with their own plan for their risk. And that's mm -hmm. key. I love that personal approach that you use. It's very important. Reduce position sizing, agree completely. I've been saying that for a long time, especially in this market and uncertainty. Um, it's always best. It helps reduce risk and it helps reduce the emotional attachment to that position. And it's not about not having emotions because we're human. Emotions are good. They're important. They, they tell us things. It's about reducing the impulsiveness, the reaction from that emotion. So um Please, uh, Samantha, thank you so much for everything, but please tell us about your services, how we can go fishing with you and, <laughs> uh, and how we can experience your secret sauce as well wow. as your plans for the future. All right. Well, I have primarily three products under the Leduc trading umbrella, and it's very much focused on pulling that amateur up, right? To intermediate, to advanced. And as such... I have a community which is housed in Discord for newer traders. I have a club called the Fishing Club, which is my core product with my live trading room and such. And then I have the Edge, which is very much geared toward kind of do it your yourself, um, uh, hedge funds or high net worth and family offices and such, which Craig actually runs, hedge fund manager. So this idea of having beginner, intermediate, and advanced product offerings is very much focused on the fact that I am not siloed, right, in my particular approach to a trading time frame or, you know, or asset um, or even target audience, retail to institutional. I, I just believe that this is um, important to operationalize some of what I see so that retail can trade it more effectively, more prof you know, profitably. And I really, really hope that this is going to help folks stay in the game. So the Discord product um, is all about community. It's mostly young, mostly newer traders that are then in a 
in a safe place, not a man cave. There, there are lots of male moderators, but the fact is that they're very giving. All of them, women and, and men that I have hired for this group is all about providing mentorship and education and risk management. So it's very different than other, you know, kind of discord communities. Um, I think this one is very special. So there are a bunch of analysts and educators and traders that are in Discord that also flow into my fishing club product. This was my my first one, right? So this is this is kind of my bread and butter of um, teaching what I see, sharing my secret sauce, all of it, and then having the more intermediate level um, trader or investor. Uh, be in my trading room or be in my you know client workspace, they can also see all the analysis and trade setups from other folks. That's that that's I'm they're there, right? Um Bob is an, an oil trader. His father before him was an oil trader. Um, you know, momentum trades using Elliott Wave, advanced options, um, gamma flow for optionality. Everyone is a focused contributor who is providing their mentoring and their trade setups for clients. My stuff in the club, we call it the club, um, is because it's it really is the 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 sharing of the market timing. So it's I'm trying to be solid generalist, be on the warning, <laughs> volatility is about to erupt, um, because of some macro and some intermarket, you know, uh, inflection points. And the 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 third product, which was basically born just recently last year is because, like I said, Craig, um, client for years, hedge fund manager, um, I wanted to create an offering, but by someone who could, I trusted and is excellent at macro, but someone who could relate to uh, portfolio managers and hedge funds and family offices, they speak the same language. I've never run a hedge fund. I don't speak that language. So it was important for me to have somebody who knew my my entire system, my people, my my style, my calls over the years, who could also serve as liaison, right, in Bloomberg chat versus them showing up for two hours every morning in my trading room. That's not going to happen, you know, <laughs> with, uh, with busy, busy money managers. So he would have his approach and very driven, you know, the, this, you know, top down macro sensibility, very strong. And how do I know? Because he would contribute, you know, when he was a client, right? So I have lots of professionals who are clients who contribute their take on the market. And I learn from them. Right. So this is why it's so valued. And so I can kind of I can really, really testify to my contributors because most of them were clients and they are now doing their thing independently for my clients. And I trust them to give excellent care and content so I can focus on my thing, which is analysis. And that's really what I enjoy doing the most. So the the the, the three products, again, are beginner discord which is a community, intermediate fishing club, which is a whole bunch of contributors, but my I, I drive it. And then macro advisor edge, which is much more bespoke pro to pro um, macro consulting and risk management for money managers. You have created quite an empire. I call it an I empire because an empire this is amazing. <laughs> the Duke trading.com. I love Thank the you. way you think. Okay. So I've been, I'm a serial entrepreneur and I've been, I've had multiple businesses. I'm a CEO, actually have a few right now. And I delegate, I have teams of people and I believe in catalyst leadership. And it sounds like you are that same way. Um, you have the, the, the mindset um, of the way you delegate, the way you have these teams, the way that you're able to be accountable and honest with yourself to know that you can't do everything because you can't. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, no matter how much energy we have and how much know-how and how much we know how to do things and we can learn, we're limited on time. And we're also, it's best to consult with experts. Then we can actually delegate and do more. And it's impressive what you've created here at the Duke Trading dot com um, and I advise anyone who's interested in learning to trade, improving their trade to check out Samantha 
Um, very impressive stuff that you have here and you are brilliant. Um, very smart No, woman. no, I'm not. I just work hard. Not brilliant. <laughs> Farm girl who works hard. Mom <laughs> radar. I work hard. But thank you very much. I appreciate the sentiment. I love what you've created here. It's 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 a brilliant creation. How about that one? Oh, thank you. I'm You're I'm welcome. very grateful that you take some time and kind of profile women in finance and trading. It matters. And I hope that other women will see this because it will inspire them to see what they can be or at least learn um, that and, and it's less intimidating and you definitely are growing the network. I applaud you and thank you. Let me know how I can help. This is this thank is, you. I felt like this is one of life. my thank you. I think this is one of my life purposes is, is to mm -hmm. showcase other fantastic women like you. Thank you so much, Samantha, for taking time and your obviously very busy schedule. <laughs> NVIDIA <laughs> came out with earnings. I'm going to go hop on that. So <laughs> thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening. Okay.